We've even etched the waveform of our voices, our voices on the side of the satellite. If this actually works, Planet Money's going to space. One minute, it's one minute, it's one minute. I mean, weirdly enough, like, I'm most afraid. I'm most afraid that it's just going to be boring. No. That I'm not going to be able to see anything. The going to rumble. Wait, why, are you, why are you whispering? Because he keeps holding his finger up silently. T minus 10 seconds. Mark. Oh my God. It's happening. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to Planet Money. I'm Robert Smith. And I'm Stacey Vanek-Smith. Today on the show, we boldly go where no podcast has gone before. Space. A decade ago, this crazy stunt, a Planet Money satellite, would never have been possible. Space was so expensive that only governments and corporations could afford to launch a satellite. But everything is changing in the space business right now. Private rocket companies are driving down the price of launches. Satellites have shrunk so much, you can hold them in the palm of your hand. It's becoming so easy, even we can do it. So over the next few episodes of Planet Money, we're going to try to make sense of this new industry by going to space ourselves. Getting a satellite took us from rural Kentucky to Silicon Valley to New Zealand. And there are so many things that can go wrong. I mean, can you really build a working satellite on the cheap? And even if you do, what can the satellite do in space? And even if you come up with a mission, what if after all this work, the rocket, the rocket just disappears off the radar? Uh, we have negative telemetry in the center here. I was just hoping you could confirm the track of the vehicle via radar. That means they've lost contact with it. I think. Everybody's waiting. Everybody's crowded around them. Walkie-talkie. Good work. Support for this NPR podcast and the following message come from Casper. Designed, developed, and assembled in the U.S., your Casper mattress is delivered right to your door in a small, how-do-they-do-that sized box. Get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash planet money and using promo code planet money at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Casper, start sleeping ahead of the curve with Casper. Okay, we have to be honest with you. The Planet Money satellite started out as a joke around the office. About eight months ago, we were brainstorming new projects. You may remember that Planet Money already made a t-shirt and followed it around the globe. We did a project where we drilled for oil and turned it into gasoline. And we're all joking, oh, you know, what's next? You know, space? Our editor, Brian, had just seen something about a SpaceX launch on the, the little news TV that's in our elevator. And we all laughed. And, you know, I immediately started to sketch a mission patch. You know, every space mission has a patch for its jumpsuit, so I'm like, oh, if we ever did this, you know, we could put a squirrel on it and our names on the mission patch. And we were all excited and talking about it, but it seemed really impossible. I mean, first of all, we obviously weren't going to get on a rocket. No. And even a satellite just seemed really out of our league. There are only a couple thousand active satellites in orbit, and they're almost exclusively owned by, like, spy agencies and governments and multi-billion dollar corporations. And imagine what it takes to build one of these satellites. I mean, I didn't know this before, but they are huge. The kind of satellites that provide GPS for our phones or cable TV or predict the weather, those satellites can be as big as a school bus. They're so complicated, so expensive, they can cost a half billion dollars. But one of our producers, Elizabeth Kulas, was really captivated by this, and she decided to look into it. She came back super excited. And she said, well, wait a minute, Elizabeth, come in here. What did they tell you? They said it is actually the perfect time to go to space. We are in the middle of a satellite revolution. These satellites are getting smaller and cheaper, and it's easier to get to space. It's like the early days of personal computers or when the internet was invented. It is wild out there right now, and we can get in on it. I still wasn't completely sure that it was possible, but, you know, I thought, fine, fine. We'll get a guide, maybe someone who can show us a possible way into this industry. And everyone kept talking about one person in particular, apparently the, the Steve Jobs of the satellite revolution. He was a guy who showed the world that anyone could go to space. He works in Kentucky. His name is Bob Twiggs. When we first spot Professor Twiggs, he is surrounded by third graders. A few kids run around. <laughs> it is field trip day at the Space Science Center at Moorhead State University. I think you ought to interview them. They're our future graduate students. Bob has white hair and he waves his hands around with excitement. 
maybe it's the kids, but he reminds me of one of those uh, owl characters in a Disney film. As an early pioneer in satellites, he could be running a billion dollar corporation, but he decided to stay in academia, and instead what he does is get students excited about space. It's kind of like jump-starting a car, you know. I think I'm like the, the guy with the battery pack on my back, and I go around to the students, and I jump-start the students. And once they get running, then I can stand out of the road, and they, they learn more on their own than I can teach them. And that is how Bob changed the satellite industry. In the late 1990s, he was teaching graduate engineering students at Stanford, and he figured they would be way more excited about designing satellites if they actually got to build one in class. But with something as big and as complicated as a satellite, this was a tough assignment. The bigger it is, the more things that they want to put in it, and they just keep designing, oh, we can add this and we can add that. Bob was working with another researcher from a university down the road, Cal Poly. His name was Jordi Pushwari. And they thought, what if they give the students a constraint, a tiny box they had to fit all of the electronics into, so it would go faster. So he goes down to a store in Mountain View, California, one of those places like a container store. You know, they sell all kinds of boxes, you know, that you're going to put uh, your favorite baseball in or your favorite basketball. Oh, so you were walking up and down the aisles saying right. too big, too big, too small, That's too small. Right. That's right. And then you saw? I saw a four-inch box. And that at the time, you know, there was the Beanie Baby craze. So that was the box that they put the Beanie Babies in. You know, you'd buy, get a Beanie Baby and display it on the shelf. So uh, this satellite started from a Beanie Baby box. Luckily, Bob did not call his invention a Beanie Baby satellite. Never name your technology after a fad. Instead, he called it the Cube Satellite. CubeSat. The CubeSat. And the original CubeSat is inside the trophy case at Moorhead State University. Bob's boss, Ben Malfras, drags us over to see it. He is so proud of this dusty plastic cube. And this is a great opportunity because the original model, I predict one day, will be in the Smithsonian. And Bob puts this box in front of his students and says, Anything you want your satellite to do has to fit in here. You can't add more parts, make the satellite bigger. You students, you have to think smaller. The general aerospace industry said that's the dumbest idea we've ever seen. Those academic guys are out of their mind because it's so small, it's not useful for anything. Remember, the aerospace industry was sending up satellites the size of a bus. And here is this researcher holding up something a little larger than a Rubik's Cube and saying, this is satellite, too. It didn't make any sense. This was not an evolution to a slightly smaller product. This was a revolution. And everything about what was inside of a satellite had to be rethought. And this might have stayed an academic exercise for the fine students at Stanford, except there was this other revolution going on at the same time. This was the early 2000s, and very early smartphones were just being invented. And all those tiny phone transmitters and processors and cameras just happened to fit into a Beanie Baby box. All of a sudden, satellites were so small that students could take risks. They could try new things. They could design a tiny satellite to take pictures of the Arctic or measure magnetic waves to predict earthquakes. And when you take risks with a new technology, that's when business innovation happens. The personal computer revolution didn't start when computers were the size of an entire room. It started when computers were small enough to play around with, to take risks with in a garage. That's how Apple started. The same with satellites. Private companies looked at this and they said, oh, I can think of a million things to do with a CubeSat. Bob remembers visiting a company recently in San Francisco called Planet. They make satellites that take pictures of the Earth, and they have almost an assembly line process now for making CubeSats. It's fun to go in there and see a, a shelf with 50 satellites sitting on it. <laughs> Never thought I'd see that. <laughs> How long would that have taken you back in the day? Oh, my, at the rate we were building them, almost 50 years. Bob told us, look, it's pretty easy. Like, even a podcast could build their own cube satellite. They do make kits for this. And you could probably make something that, you know, goes beep, beep, beep in space for, you know, under $10,000. And, you know, beeping in space, that's cool, right? I yeah. mean, that's, that's better than beeping on the ground. It's like Sputnik. But I kind of thought we'd have a satellite that could do something cool, like take pictures of North Korea or track cargo ships or monitor global warming. Yeah, for that level of satellite, we're going to have to make some difficult decisions. We're going to need to go shopping for our very own CubeSat. There is apparently a Walmart of satellites. It is the Small Satellite Conference in Logan, Utah. Like Small Satellite Conference or Small Satellite 
conference. <laughs> the satellites are small. The conference is massive. Oh my God, it's a robot. It's a robot. I think it's a robot. Once upon a time, the small satellite conference was for academics. Scientists who were building hardware, data analysts, and, and they are still here, and a lot of students too. But these days, you can smell the money in the air. The big rocket companies are here, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Rocket Lab. And every 20 feet, you can stop by a booth of some startup satellite company, giving away little light-up keychains and foam rocket ships. And Bob's tiny CubeSats are everywhere. It is an industry standard now. You can get a single box. It is called a 1U, as in one Beanie Baby unit. So it's just this basic, just the basic setup. Just this basic thing I'm holding in my hand. It's like a frame with uh, some yeah. electronics in it. Yeah. Is ten thousand dollars. Right. Very doable. Right. Of course, then you have to fill up the CubeSat. There are booths that will sell you powerful cameras, radiation monitors. Mike Creech at the booth for Millennium Space Systems says it could get expensive. You have to have power. You need some sort of computer. You need a way to navigate, know where you are in uh, space in the sky. Um, and those things just take time to develop, and every single mission is unique. In that case, you might want to upgrade to a 3U satellite, Ooh. as in three Beanie Baby units. Yeah. And the booth for the company, Blue Canyon, has a bunch of cool, shiny floor models. So I asked Dan Hagel, if we wanted your basic model, like you're just your cheapest stripped down box with some electronics, what range of cost are we talking about? Our, our equipment is probably the highest end that you're going to find in this category. There's but it's still a fraction of a price of a traditional spacecraft. You want to, you want to drop the sticker price on me? What's it going to be? <laughs> I don't know if I should say that. Well, let's say well under a million. Under a million? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can hear our producer, Elizabeth, laughing out loud at that price tag. I mean, compared to the half billion dollar communication satellite, these are a bargain. But we were thinking maybe more in the like thousands or hundreds of dollars range. <laughs> you know, I actually talked to them about a used satellite and they looked at me <laughs> like I was crazy. Like where are you where are you gonna find a used satellite? eBay. It's always on eBay. You know, I figured we could always play the nonprofit card, you know, the sort of charity impulse. So, you know, we started to talk to people at the conference about who might lend us a satellite, you know, for journalistic purposes, allow us to adopt one for a short mission. We called everybody who makes satellites saying, hey, do you have an extra satellite? Can we jump on board with your satellite? We begged. We begged. Could we maybe just put our name on a satellite? Maybe do something cool with it? And one company said, let's talk about it. Why don't you drop by our office, it's in San Francisco, and we can discuss this proposal. It was, in fact, the company that Bob Twiggs had mentioned that he visited in San Francisco, the company with the strangely similar name to ours, Planet. I felt like this was a good sign. It's open. Oh, thanks. Planet's San Francisco office is right down the street from the headquarters of Twitter and Uber, and they're going for the same tech startup vibe. Although, because it is space hardware, I have to sign a promise not to steal any military secrets. Confidential information. Show me any technical, non-technical. Like my Apple Terms of Service contract, I did not read the fine print, signed it anyway, and now I can legally enjoy my tour. It starts in mission control with the launch director, which sounds way more serious than it is. Like Safian is 29 years old, pretty laid back guy. And Mission Control looks like the back of a Best Buy. A bunch of TVs on the wall and hardware piled on the desks. We have satellites lying around everywhere. Um, and so Wait, there's like four or five of them in a cabinet here. Yes, and that, that's just for starters. So there's another cabinet full of satellites over there. Now you're just showing off. Yeah, well. The reason they have so many is that Planet's business model is changing the way we take pictures of the Earth. I mean, we've all seen those satellite photos on Google Maps, right? Everyone checks their house. Everyone checks their house. And those pictures were taken by big satellites that basically only get a good shot of your house every six months or a year. But Planet thought, hey, with all of these little CubeSats, why wait for one big satellite to trundle by? Why not launch hundreds of small ones? Build them faster, launch them faster, take more risks? It's the CubeSat way. Mike shows me a TV in back with an image of the Earth. And you can see all these little dots, you know, maybe 200 of them. Each one is a satellite the planet has in orbit. Over Hawaii, uh, Alaska, 
over the North Pole. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a big string of satellites going down over the United Kingdom, looks like through France, Spain, through Each one Morocco, of those little satellites Arizona. is up in space, 300 miles up. And they whip around the globe from the North Pole to the South Pole then back to the North Pole again every 90 minutes, taking pictures the whole way. North Pole, South Pole, North Pole, South Pole. If you could float in space and see it, it would look like... What would appear to be like a string of pearls going over roughly the North Pole from north to south. Um, and as the string of pearls is rotating in its orbit, the Earth is rotating underneath. And so that, that line of satellites acts as a line scanner. And so they're slowly sweeping across the Earth's surface every 24 hours, um, and that enables us to get an image of every place. A picture of almost every place on Earth every 24 hours. The way it works is that no matter where you are on Earth, at around 10 o'clock in the morning... When you're just getting coffee. There is almost certainly a tiny planet satellite whizzing by over your head. And taking a picture. It is mind-boggling. And, you know, when Planet first started to launch its satellites a few years ago, they would name each one and have these big ceremonies. Now they have so many, it is totally routine. So routine, would a company like this even notice if a public radio podcast just, you know, borrowed a satellite for a little while? Maybe we could push a couple tote bags their way? And so we asked, can we have one? I mean, not to keep, you know, just to borrow it for a little while. Like, no money changing hands, no contract, just a sort of temporary adoption situation. And some calls were made up the management chain, and they said, how about Satellite Zero F1C? I went down to the lab to see it. Okay, so welcome to the uh, factory. We need to put on coats, but we can help you with that. And finally, I meet someone who's recognizable from all of the space exploration movies. The guy who builds the satellites is wearing a bow tie and a lab coat. His name is Chester Gilmore. And this is Planet Money Satellite. This is your adopted spacecraft, so they tell me. I don't know what to say. I mean, it's gorgeous. Look, it's shiny. Oh, OK, so how, how do you normally describe the size of this? Uh, about the size of a loaf of bread. Or, you know, maybe a, a shoebox for, like, ballet slippers. Yes, very, very nice, elegant, handcrafted, very uh, capable ballet slippers. Just two dudes talking about ballet <laughs> slippers. It happens. I mean, technically, this is a 3U. That's three Beanie Baby boxes. It is the direct descendant of Bob Twig's trip to a container store. Can I pick it up? Yes. Yes. You paused for a moment there. Well, yeah, because this is actually going to go into space. So anywhere else, they would probably tell you, absolutely not, you can never pick up a satellite. But yes, you can pick up the satellite. I'll ask you to pick it up like this. I was just allowed to touch the edges, and when I pick it up, it is super dense. You know, like picking up a baby, okay? Okay. And if you break it, you buy it. Joking, Chester <laughs> says, kind of. Uh, these things are pretty tough. He tells me this story about one time when they were launching a rocket with these little CubeSats in it, and the rocket blew up. It blew up after launch, and satellites just like this one rained down all over the beach. And we turned them on, and they all worked. Chester opens up the metal casing and he shows me inside. There's lots of little gold parts, but basically it's a big camera. Like one of those cameras with the giant lens you see on the sidelines of sporting events. And all around the lens is the electronics. There's a little antenna to send the photos back to Earth. Little gizmos that allow you to turn the satellite, steer it a bit. Chester says you can put together the whole thing in about four hours. Amazing. It can go from assembly to testing to space in a matter of months. And that's the key to this whole new space business. The idea is to move fast and to innovate quickly. They basically treat satellites like, you know, like iPhones, right? They release a bunch into space. And then, you know, months later, they come up with redesigns and updates. They launch some more and then some more and then some more. The satellites go up quick. And then after a few years, after a few years, they start to burn up. Yeah, Chester says one day you'll be looking at a photo from a satellite and you'll notice that the images of the Earth are getting closer and closer and closer. So the first thing that happens is our imagery gets better because we're closer. It's a good news, bad news it's situation. It's a good news, bad news situation. Yeah, it's like you're talking to it the whole time it's going, you could be talking to it the whole time it's going down. And the Earth gets closer and closer, the images get better and better, and then... It doesn't actually make that noise. No, but we all make the noise quietly. Is there like a... And then we raise a glass. 
the death of a satellite is treated as a kind of celebration because it allows Planet to replace that satellite with a better one, with more features. Even if we manage to get little zero F1C, the Planet Money satellite, into space, it is not going to have long to live. So we have to make the most of its short, beautiful life. And Chester lets me in on a little secret. Making a satellite is pretty straightforward. Figuring out how to get it into space and what to do with it once it's there, that part is more complicated. Next time on Planet Money, what can you do with a brand new satellite? What are all these new companies with billions of dollars worth of tiny spacecraft even doing in the sky above our heads? What will be the mission for Zero F1C? Support for this podcast and the following message come from Bose. Enjoy your podcasts any way you want with the Bose QC35 Wireless Headphones 2. You'll be free from noise and free from wires. To learn more, visit Bose.com slash planet. Bose, get closer. Any thoughts on what Planet Money's little zero F1C satellite should do? Send us an email, planetmoney at npr.org. You can also find us on Twitter or Facebook. And I'll be posting some behind-the-scenes photos of our satellite adventure on my Instagram. I'm at Radiosmith. And Stacy, I should warn our listeners that my original dream became a reality. A beautiful reality. Lay your eyes on the Planet Money space mission patch. Oh my gosh, that is a really sharp looking patch. We've got the squirrel holding a little microphone and our satellite. There's zero F1C and a little astronaut. Of course, our logo is on there. We'll tell you how to get one in a later episode. Today's episode and this entire series was produced by Elizabeth Kulas with an assist from Nick Mountain. Alex Goldmark is our supervising producer. Brian Erstadt edits the show. Special thanks today to our friends at Auburn University, Jan Wurzinger and Michael Fogel. Also thanks to Michael Stonecipher, Matt Kraft, Rachel Holm, and Trevor Hammond, who helped set things up with Planet. I'm Stacey Vanek-Smith. And I'm Robert Smith. Thanks for listening. We have to figure out what we're going to write on the side of our satellite. Oh, okay. So we can draw something. We can put the name of the craft. Sky's the limit. Sky's the limit. Anything at all? I thought you were saying that's the title. It's not a terrible title. Sky's the limit, yeah. But we should ask people on the team. We should ask everyone. Oh, some sort of some sort of phrase, some sort of inspiring phrase, like to the stars, per ardua ad astra, uh, through difficulty to the stars. What is this? Uh, it's a Latin phrase, per ardua ad astra, through difficulty to the stars. Where'd you get this from? Uh, it's the state motto of Kansas, but it's also my personal motto for many years there. I know, okay, I know. So, so write that in there, right? Okay. I was just coming up with names oh, yeah, yeah, and just, phrases. Yeah, yeah. The Starship Free Enterprise. Good. That's a good one. Maybe productivity rising. Productivity rising. Globalization and beyond. <laughs> it literally goes around the Earth every 90 minutes. And beyond. And beyond. <laughs> um, capital flight. Oh, capital flight's not bad. Um, no such thing as a free launch. Free launch is not bad. Small sat big data. I mean, small sat big data. <laughs> I like how you translated that. Uh, PM3 CPO. I will burn up. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. You know, maybe instead of I will burn up, maybe it's money to burn. Money to burn. Nice. Okay, money to burn. And then I'm going to write money to burn up. Okay. So, Stacy, this is what I'm afraid of, which is we came up with like a bunch of good jokey names. Yeah. But do we really want to say them for like four episodes? Right. Puns, they can lose steam quickly. You would know. Yeah, I, I would. So I'm thinking we should go with something simple, okay. something classic. Okay. I want to lay this on you. Pod one. I like it. Pod one. It's got a lot of potential. Oh, God. <laughs> I think you just ruined I'm it. I'm sorry. You came to the wrong person. I think you ruined it. I did not. <laughs> I did not. Support for NPR and the following message come from Doctors Without Borders, an independent, rapid-response medical humanitarian organization with teams in more than 70 countries. Learn more about how you can help at doctorswithoutborders.org forward slash NPR. In the very early days of satellites, you pretty much knew what the mission of any given satellite was going to be. Spying on the enemy. And at the time, the object of interest was pretty singular, the Soviet Union. 
Robert Cardillo's job was to study the photos that came down from those U.S. spy satellites. Every day he would go to a windowless government building in Washington, D.C., into a dimly lit room, and he would sit down at something called a light table with a single photograph on it. And then uh, imagine a microscope, right? I'm now peering through a microscope. I'm looking at... uh garrisons that have military equipment at. I'm looking at test sites in which they might be employing a new missile technology. I'm looking at ports to see what the development of their naval capabilities are. Lots of people would look at the same photograph for hours. They called it torturing the pixels. And they had to torture the pixels because each and every spy photo of the Soviet Union was incredibly rare and valuable. In the early days, satellites would take pictures on rolls of film. This was before digital photography, where you could just beam the picture back to Earth from space. So there were actually giant rolls of film inside of the satellites. And so they had to figure out a way to get that film back to Earth from space. And they came up with this brilliant solution. The program had the secret code name Corona. And the Corona satellites were designed to take pictures and then sort of poop out the canister of film from the bottom of the satellite and eject it into space. Once it reached the atmosphere, it would deploy a parachute. I kid you not. Now it's floating down over the Pacific Ocean. Your spy satellite photos. A U.S. Air Force plane with basically a trapeze on the end of it. So think of it, two poles and a big net. Would have to time it so that as it floated down, it flew right over top of it, caught the parachute in its net, thus caught the canister. It's, it's inconceivable to me. There is a falling canister of film from space, and an airplane catches it in a net. In midair. Yeah. That's American ingenuity. In the decades since then, the U.S. has, of course, launched thousands of better satellites, able to beam down millions of photos rather than just what it could fit on a roll of film. And Robert Cardillo now runs the entire agency in charge of all that new information the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And he laughs looking back at his time in that windowless building in that dim room because his problem now is too much data. So many photographs to go through. So many pixels to torture. How many people like you, like your old job, how many people would you need to go through the kind of data we're getting now? So we would have to hire 8 million imagery analysts to accommodate such data. Of course they're not going to hire 8 million people. In fact, right now, the U.S. government is training computers to do those jobs in the future. But it highlights this issue that the entire satellite business is thinking about right now, which is how do we handle this flood of pictures and data coming in from space? And does the world even need any more satellites? Maybe we should have thought of this before Planet Money (laughs) decided to go to space. It is Monday morning satellite launching. Five, four, three, two, one. We have ignition. Whoa, it's so bright. Hello and welcome to Planet Money. I'm Robert Smith. And I'm Stacey Vanek-Smith. No relation. Move over International Space Station. Why don't you give us some room, Hubble Telescope, because Planet Money has a brand new satellite. And we're going to put it in orbit. This is part two of our series. If you want to hear how podcasters like us even got our hands on a spacecraft, amazing. you should go back and listen to the first episode. We talked there about how there is a revolution right now in the space industry. Satellites are getting small and cheap and plentiful, and it raises a big question for everyone. What are they all going to do up in space? Today on the show, what should the Planet Money satellite do? The mission to find the mission. <laughs> Support for Planet Money and the following message come from Wonder Capital, the leading solar investment platform. With Wonder Capital, investors like you can now invest in large-scale solar energy projects across the U.S., earning up to 7.5% annually. Create an account for free at wondercapital.com slash planetmoney. Commit your investment before January 1st to take advantage of Wonder's holiday special, zero investor fees. Wonder Capital, where impact investing meets capitalism. We have named the Planet Money satellite Pod 1. It's about 12 inches long a foot. It's basically a little telescope with a camera. And when it is up 300 miles above the Earth, it will be able to do essentially what those Corona satellites did, take pictures of whatever Planet Money wants to spy on. When we last left Pod 1, it was sitting on a workbench at the satellite company we're working with, Planet. No relation. No relation. And in this briefcase, Stacy. No. I have a model of it. No. Right here. Oh, 
it's so cute. Little potty. It's about the size of a loaf of bread. <laughs> With like solar cell wings. Yeah, no, it's got a little little camera lens on it. So that feeling, that feeling that you have right now, Stacy, that excitement about sending something you have touched into orbit, it has a name. And it's a name I heard over and over again when I talked to experts. We have officially diagnosed space fever. You're not the only ones. That is the big problem. Stacy, meet Silvano Payne. He is publisher of Sat News. He's been covering this industry for a long time. And he says, what we have forgotten here at Planet Money is that a satellite is just a tool. It is just a simple tool to collect and transmit some sort of data. A lot of people get caught up in the technology and forget that somehow that technology has to be paid for. And so there has to be a business case. There has to be a client who needs some data. Yeah, data. Yeah, Yeah, there's to be a client. But you know what no one wants to work in? No one wants to work in a data company. They want to work for a space company. Correct. Correct. Savannah says right now all sorts of companies are racing to be in the space business, to get their tiny satellites into orbit, and yet they do not have a strong plan for how they're going to make money off of it. Like us? Yeah, I know. The challenge is there are too many plans going on. There's too much being built. There's a lot of venture funds around that are being poured into a lot of these companies and um, and and they're going to be failures and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm wrong obviously in this regard but uh, there is a bubble. Do you think <laughs> I have considered it that yes. it is possible yes. that when a podcast sends a satellite into space that is when you know there's a bubble? That has occurred to me but This existential crisis, this is exactly what the entire industry is facing right now. Everyone's asking the same question we are, which is, does the world really need another satellite? What can we do with a satellite that will change the world? I mean, it is such a production to get to space. We we have to do something to make it worthwhile. We have to send little potty off on some kind of worthy mission. Yeah, so first we have to figure out what our satellite is able to do, to take it for a test drive, essentially. So I arranged to sit down with Catherine Scott. She runs the image analytics team at Planet, the people who let us adopt one of their satellites. They have about 200 satellites just like ours, already in space, already taking pictures every day. And so I just wanted to see, like, just today, just today, what did those satellites get? Today, it's almost two to four terabytes a day comes down. It's something on that order of magnitude. And How many so it's, photos would it be? How many photos got taken of the Earth oh today? Oh, jeez. Uh, well, they're about 25 megs each. Uh, so it's about, yeah, it's about 800,000 images every day. 800,000 photos a day, so no one can, can look through them. There's not a human being here no. watching the photos come down. No, everything is automatic. Planet has computers that stitch together all of the photos of the Earth every day. So you can essentially do that thing you always see in spy movies, you know, pick a spot on the Earth and then zoom in. Oh, enhance, enhance. Exactly. All that power at your fingertips. And me, like I'm such an idiot, the first thing I say when I sit down at this incredibly massive opportunity is... Oh, I would love to see my apartment building in Brooklyn. Oh, no, everyone does that the first day. Wait, and then, and everyone's like, show me my home. Yeah, Area 51, and then maybe if they're really creative, they're like, I want to see North Korea. Ah, nice. So where are you on the block? Uh, I am, okay, you see that this this little lump right there is a, is a synagogue, and yeah. we're right there on the other side. Yeah, yeah, right on that street. You can see my apartment building, my kids' school, a few trucks. And I realize I'm using this cutting-edge technology to basically take the world's most expensive selfie. (laughs) Well, I mean, isn't that why pretty much everybody does everything now, though? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And, you know, Catherine says do not underestimate the value of a selfie from space. Because she (laughs) says the Planet Money satellite is not just a camera. It's a time machine, right? It is a time machine. Because our satellite will be taking photos every day at the same time, you can then go back and see how things change. And if you can go back in time and figure out a model, you can actually guess what the future is going to hold to. For instance, we're looking at my neighborhood, and Catherine says, look over here at this construction site. It's a few blocks from my apartment. They're building a new part for the hospital. And she says you can go back in time and figure out how quickly the construction crews are moving. You can actually see that. Like, yeah, you see, like you can see, they, they, those used to be buildings there, and they took it out. Yep. Huh. And 
you know, I mean, if I did some analytics, you know, I could use this data to figure out when they will finally stop running all of those trucks through my neighborhood every day. It's exciting that we finally have the technology to help you fight your neighborhood battles, Robert. I have, I have many of them. But I, I agree. Like, we should think bigger for the Planet Money satellite. In your block, yes. Let's think a little bigger. So, for instance, Planet makes money by selling access to this time machine that Catherine's been showing me. And they sort of sell it in bulk, right? For a dollar or two, literally like one or two dollars, you can get pictures of one square kilometer over the course of a year. And they sell subscriptions to this data to farmers, agriculture companies, to the U.S. government. Robert Cardillo, the photo analyst turned director of an agency we talked to earlier, he just made a deal for the U.S. government to pay Planet $14 million for photos of high-priority areas. That would be North Korea. <laughs> but everyone we talked to said, look, the real money is not in taking photos of the Earth. It is in analyzing the photos, in finding the patterns, the patterns that no one else knows about. So we need to think like spies. Like spies. And I found some that would talk to us. They work in, believe it or not, an old converted dairy barn in Louisville, Kentucky. I visited there with producer Elizabeth Kulak. Hi, Dick. Hi, security. Hi. Hi there. Hi. I'm Deirdre. I'm Deirdre. I'm Deirdre. I'm Deirdre. I'm Deirdre. Hey. Robert. Good to meet you. How are you? Deirdre Alfenar is the chief R&D officer at Genscape. The boring way to describe what Genscape does is market intelligence. But really... We have been described as the James Bond of commodities and energy markets. So. By the I'll Wall Street it. Journal, no less. Oh, that's a pretty good pull quote. <laughs> that's the pull quote you want from the Wall Street Journal, I think. Yeah, so that was pretty exciting. Deirdre explains that in the financial world, everyone wants an edge a little piece of data that no one else has. And Genscape sells them that data. According to public documents, the company brings in around $100 million a year. We have a, our lab here. She takes us into a room that I swear is like that scene from every James Bond film where he gets his gadgets, you know? The exploding watch, the deadly pen. The deadly pen. And there is even a Q here. His name is Antoine Robinson. He's working on some contraption. So, for instance, let's say some oil traders somewhere want to know how much gas is flowing through a pipeline so they can make a bet on the price of gas. Antoine holds up a box that can eavesdrop on pipelines. There's a directional microphone, and then there's an uh, omnidirectional microphone that we attach to these. You can hear the the pumps when they're on and when they're running. What does it sound like? Um, mm, that's very high pitched. I need a lower voice. We need Ant. Mm. Mm. If the pipeline goes quiet, Genscape will send out an alert to its customers. They have similar gadgets for people who trade electricity. So energy traders want to know if power plants are running at full capacity in the middle of the night. Deirdre pulls out one of their night vision cameras. Oh, these are like thermal imaging yeah. spy cameras. Oh, so cool. So they look at heat signatures from power plants, from refineries, from anything that is hot. Um, and we use those signals to indicate whether those refineries are running or not, or the power plants are running or not. That is awesome. Can we do something like this with Pod 1? With our satellites, they do use satellites. So a lot of the things that she showed me, you have to get close to the pipeline or the power plant in order to get the secret info. But satellites have allowed them to monitor everything, everywhere. We walk into this huge room, and there's all of these different desks, and everyone is watching different commodities around the globe. So shut them out. What's over there? Oil. Oil's over there. Power. Power, electricity. Shout hey. out to power, folks. Uh, ag. Corn, soybeans, maybe. Soybeans, we have a soybean monitoring product. So the people in this room are looking at the pictures from Planet, from satellites exactly like ours, and they're turning them into information that people will pay money for. So one researcher we talked to is tallying satellite images of oil wells being drilled in South Sudan. Another one shows me the smokestacks from a power plant in India. He can tell exactly, like, at what capacity it's running at. And then Deirdre asked her team to show me their newest secret spy trick. It's like something out of a movie. Marcus Waldner and Brent Sunheimer open a window on their computer. Click, click, click. I see something that looks like a shipping port, a seam from space. So what are we looking at here? Is this an actual place? Yes, this is um, a port in China, Dalian. Click, click, we zoom in, and I see what looks like a bunch of white marshmallows. 
oil tanks. And you can see in this photo how much oil is in each tank? Correct. No, 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 no. And, and, I want to see that. Where is it? A few more clicks, and all of a sudden there are little numbers laid over each tank. The computer has taken satellite images, looked at the shadows on the roofs of the tanks. And, and the roofs where these oil tanks are floating, so they go up and down, up and down. The computer looks at the shadow, calculates the angle of the sun, and can tell you the height of each roof. And then as we go through everything that the algorithm has analyzed, we can see every tank's So this is 17.5% full of this tank in China that you've never seen in your life? Correct. Well, I've seen it through satellite imagery. Of course. <laughs> Genscape just launched this service, a daily news feed telling customers how much oil there is stored in China. And even though it's based on Planet's satellite photos, satellite photos like the ones we will take, it is the analysis of the data. It's the way they cut it and use it and market it. That is what is making the money. And the service has been a hit. Oil companies, shipping firms, commodity traders can use these numbers to make decisions. When the oil tanks get low in China, you can literally start to send oil-filled ships across the Pacific before China even asks for it. It seems like the logical end to this is that someday, anytime there is an additional well, an additional ship, an additional tank somewhere in the world, we're all going to know about it. That's right. Yeah, we're all going to know about it, and we're probably going to know within the day. And this is just one supply chain. Um, it's this is just be, oil. Yeah, it's going to be the same for all commodities, but it's also going to be the same for how many new homes are being built, uh, how much more traffic are on the highways. Um, avocados? How much more avocados Soybeans? are being grown. You know, it, yeah, exactly, exactly. Avocados are like Robert's atomic unit really? of measurement. <laughs> avocados. Yeah. Yes, I, I do always bring up avocados. But now that I have all these spy techniques in my mind, it gets me thinking about a possible mission for the Planet Money satellite, for pod one. Now, I love avocados. I love avocados. I would support any avocado mission for pod one. Let's do avocados. As you know, Stacy, here in New York, avocados are this pricing mystery. Someday you'll go by a little store and you'll be like, oh my God, there's an avocado for a dollar. I'm that totally is a good that. day. That's I a mean, great day. Yeah. But then you come back the next day. And they're like $3 a piece, yes, all the time. Yeah, and who knows why, right? I would love some data that would tell me how prices are gonna change in the avocado market. Before we leave Genscape, I give this pitch to Deirdre and her colleague, Joseph Spilinka. I have the perfect name for our project. The guacamole pipeline. Right. I mean, the entire country needs guacamole for the Super Bowl. Nobody knows how many avocados are out there. I mean, maybe somebody knows. I mean, maybe everybody knows. But we don't know. So we could use our satellite to make a bet on the avocado supply before the Super Bowl. It sounds insane. Yes. It does. And you have to love the folks at Genscape because they listened to this and they treated it like it was the most normal idea in the world. Yeah, probably. We can look in a different uh, part of the visible spectrum or a different part of the, uh, of the light spectrum to see um, growth quality the same way they do for corn and other crops in the United States. Yeah. What else can we do? Count trucks? Avocado trucks? Count trucks, count ships, count... I don't know if they store avocados in piles or put them on pallets or put them in buckets, but we could count those as well, yeah. Deirdre suggests that maybe there's some sort of avocado bottleneck somewhere we could monitor. I mean, why don't you just monitor, like, limes and tomatoes? I don't know. Really? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're joking, but there is a name for this. Tracking complementary commodities. It's actually one of the techniques they use at Genscape. You know, with the assumption that, you know, maybe the corn chip people know something that we don't about avocados. Let me get this straight for a second. We're going to use this cutting edge technology, this like intergalactic, whatever, unprecedented moment in space technology to corner the guacamole market. Guac finger. <laughs> I am guac finger. Guac finger. Wah, 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 wah. Okay. <laughs> It is one of the missions we are looking into. But there are some other options in case, you know, we want to use our satellite for, you know, good <laughs> instead right. of guacamole evil. Right. Uh, we've been talking to some researchers who need help collecting some data for farmers in Africa. That's a worthy project. We're going to know more about this once we can get the satellite into the sky and sending back real pictures. Yeah, when is that going to happen? That is an excellent 
question. <laughs> because as we've been chasing the mission, there is this other big problem that we have not yet solved, which is how do we put Pod 1, the Planet Money satellite, into orbit? Next time on Planet Money, we travel the globe shopping for a rocket. Let's just say I know a guy. I'm kind of like your your best friend that's going to find you a rocket somewhere in the world that has extra space. Support for this NPR podcast and the following message come from Slack, where work happens all over the world. No more losing time context switching. More than a thousand apps seamlessly integrate with Slack. So that's less time jumping between tools and more time getting things done. More at slack.com. Would you, the Planet Money listener, like to join the avocado cartel? Or let's be honest, you probably have a better idea for what we should do with a satellite. Send us an email, planetmoney at npr.org. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is at planetmoney. Oh, and I'm posting behind-the-scenes photos of our space journey on my Instagram, at Radio Smith. And we have been getting some notes about the Planet Money mission patch that you designed, Robert, the one featuring the squirrel. And a little gold star for every single member of the Planet Money team. And we will tell you in the next episode, next Wednesday, how to get it. Today's episode was produced by Elizabeth Kulas with an assist from Nick Fountain, Sally Helm, and Kasia Mihailovich. Alex Goldmark is our supervising producer. Brian Erstad edits the show. Special thanks today to Chris Biddy and Bronwyn Agrios of Astro Digital and Ajit Ibrahim from NanoRats. I'm Robert Smith. And I'm Stacey Vanek Smith. Thanks for listening. Oh, oh, did I tell you about the shooting star guy we met? No. So we're at the small satellite conference and we're asking around, like, what is the, the weirdest way that anyone is making money off of satellites? And they said, oh, you got to go talk to... Josh Rodenbaum from this company called Ale. Here's what he does. We uh, are creating artificial shooting stars. Artificial shooting stars. Artificial shooting stars. Wow, really? Like, could you, could you like buy one for your girlfriend or something? Exactly. So shooting stars are just little debris that go through the atmosphere. Right. And this guy's plan is he's going to launch a satellite with a bunch of little fake shooting stars in them. So what we do is we send up a satellite to low Earth orbit with several hundred of our shooting star particles. When a customer calls, they say, hey, we want, we want a meteor shower. It's this night. So, so maybe I'm, I'm, I'm Tokyo and I have the Olympics in... 2020. 2020. <laughs> and I want to end my opening ceremonies with shooting stars coming out of the sky. That's right. And we say, okay. And when our satellite passes over, we release them. They burn. Even in this bright, bright city, you will be able to look up and see the stars. So he has not launched the satellite or sold any of these things yet, but he said um, a million dollars will buy you a pretty good show. I think that's a pretty great way to spend a million dollars, honestly. On a meteor shower? (laughs) Okay, I guess he's going to be rich. I guess he's going to be rich. Hey, NPR. Starting a business can be a risky endeavor. Hit listen or add to cue now to hear stories of entrepreneurship and innovation. Support for NPR and this channel come from the Economic Development Authority of Fairfax County, Virginia. Learn more at powerofideas.org. This is part three of our space series. If you have ever wondered how you can personally send something up into space... You can do it. Go back a couple of episodes and catch up. We will wait. Are we good? I think so. All right. Here is something that surprised me about the space business. Once you build a satellite and decide what you want it to do in space, you have to go shopping for a rocket to put it on. And of course, anytime you're shopping for something expensive, there's always a guy, right? There's a guy with a line. I'm kind of like your your best friend that's going to find you a rocket somewhere in the world that has extra space. Phil Bristol is a rocket broker, meaning if you have a satellite. And we do. The Planet Money satellite, ready to go. If you have a satellite, then Phil is the man who can get you a lift to space. He says it's just like buying any other big ticket item. There's a car for, for every consumer, and there's a, a type of rocket for every type of satellite and where you want to go. We met Phil at the small satellite conference in Logan, Utah. He handed us a card. It said right on there, spaceflight.com. And he said you can book rocket flights right on the web, just like Expedia, for rockets. You put in how big your satellite is, when you want to go, and Phil will find you a launch. It may take a year or so to find room for your satellite. The business is booming these days. But there are a lot of places to launch from. 
New Zealand, California, Florida, Kazakhstan, Japan, India. They all have rockets ready to go? Yes. The very existence of Phil, the very existence of this conversation shows you how much the space business has changed. Decades ago, satellites were massive, and they would go up on rockets owned by space agencies. It could cost $100 million to launch. So there weren't many deals to be done. Now we're in an age of tiny satellites that you can hold in the palm of your hand. Rockets can fit dozens of them. A tiny cube satellite could hitch a ride to space for as cheap as $300,000. Or as Phil, the consummate salesman, says, $295,000. $295,99. <laughs> we tell Phil about the Planet Money satellite. It is about the size of a loaf of bread. We adopted it from the startup satellite company Planet, who kindly let us put our name on it. And Phil says he can totally help. Think about what you want your rocket to say about you. It's like picking out a car. So as a podcast going to space for the first time, maybe we want to pick out something classic, something safe, like he suggests Orbital ATK. I mean, they're on time, they're reliable, very few mishaps. Kind of a Volvo. <laughs> That's actually a very apt uh, description of, of, of Orbital ATK. It's definitely like a Volvo. Phil says there is, of course, SpaceX, Elon Musk's rocket company take off and land. Super cool right now. Obviously, it is the Tesla of the space business. Or there is this new company, a small startup called Rocket Lab out of New Zealand. It's still in the testing phase, but they have a plan to eventually launch a rocket every single week. They're the new hotness. Really hot. So hot. So hot right now. Wait, why? Uh, 52 launches in a year. The price is right. It changes the game for sure. So what kind of car would uh, Rocket Labs be? I don't know. That's, that, that's tough. We debated it for a surprisingly long time. We had to have a car that was sort of sporty and affordable, you know, with curves. Like a Corvette or like one of those little sporty Miatas. Sure, like some sort of red sports car. Definitely convertible. Hotness. The hotness. Okay, so what is it going to be for the Planet Money satellite? Should we pick the family sedan? Very safe. Or the sports car? I think... We need to take some test drives. Hello and welcome to Planet Money. I'm Stacey Vanek Smith. And I'm Robert Smith. Today on the show, Planet Money is in the market for a brand new rocket. Rocket shopping. There is a new space race going on. But instead of the U.S. versus the Soviet Union, it's dozens of tiny startup companies competing to send tiny little satellites into orbit. It has become so easy to make satellites that even we're doing it. The Planet Money Satellite, Little Pod 1, we're calling it, it is ready to launch. But the new space race has reached a bottleneck. There are not enough rockets for everyone to get quickly into orbit. So today on the show, we show you how the rocket makers are trying to catch up. The problem is, when you're shopping for a tube of metal that spews out flames at 5,000 degrees, the trip doesn't always go as planned. Support for Planet Money and the following message come from Betterment. They want to know, are you getting as much as you can from your investments? Betterment is the largest independent online financial advisor, and they now offer a free investment review, which helps you assess your investment accounts, tax strategies, 